everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you watched my latest haul video, you would have seen that I recently picked up the um, Core Modern Watercolors in the High Chroma set. And today I would like to do a first impression review. Now, I know I've said in the past that I would never do first impression reviews, but I've actually come to change my opinion a little bit about that. And let me explain for just a second why. Because when it comes to things like those Mount Vision um, iridescent pastels, for example, which I'll be doing a review on next. I've already done a full review on my channel on the Mount Vision pastels. So to do a review on a new set or a new colorway or something like that, I feel like I've worked with them enough and I have the experience that I know what I'm talking about. This is a similar story here. I did try the, the watercolors from Core in the past. I had like a, a sample dot card that I'd gotten years ago, but also I've been a watercolorist for a really, really long time. If you've seen any of my watercolor reviews on this channel in the past, you'll already know that and that I've done a lot of reviews on watercolor. And so I feel like I'm going to do, for this video, to do, to do these paints justice and do a fair review, I want to do two parts. The first part is going to be a first impression. We're going to swatch them out. We're going to talk about it. And then is a week later, I'll come back and I'll give a follow up. Okay, so I'll work with them some more and I'll see what happens as they dry in the, in the pans and things like that. And I'll give my final assessment. So that's what we're going to do today on these. So the first thing I wanted to show you is the packaging. So this is the high chroma set. I paid about $30 for these. They are generously filled. You get these 15 milliliter tubes, six of them in these really bold colors. I thought that would be the most fun and enjoyable way for me to get these since I've got a lot of watercolors and I definitely didn't need these, but I wanted to try them. Inside the set, um, they used to have a hinge on their tin and they used to be way too big. Like I remember when they first came out, you know, just this set would have been in a tin two or three times this size and it would have had a little hinge on it. So it would have taken, it would have been much more cumbersome is what I'm saying and took up a lot more room, but they really compacted the whole thing and I'm very pleased to see that. I also love that I can take the lid off and put it down on the side and move this off completely if I like. So the tin is really nice quality. You've got all these little wells and mixing areas. I'm happy about that. I'm gonna very briefly turn it over. You get the nice packaging. It's like a satin mat and I love it. I already put some paints out. I saved just one for us to do together because I wanted to save time. So I squirted these out. They're fresh. I just put them out. And here's the rest of the tin. I like it. I'm a big fan of the tin, a big fan of the tin. I don't have anything like it and it's very functional. And so I'm happy with it. I love that. Um, I have some 100% cotton watercolor paper here. This is a cold press and I've already went ahead and labeled everything and put down a strip of ink. Um, waterproof India ink and allowed that to dry. You also get a brochure in here that talks a little bit about the core modern watercolors. What makes them special and different is their revolutionary binder known as Aquazol. And then you get a full color chart. I'll go ahead and put that up like that so you can pause the screen and look at it if you like. So inside this set for around $30, you get six 15 milliliter tubes and a lot of them are series three paints. You get four series three, a series four, which is the cobalt teal, and you get one series two. So I'll go over the colors real quick. You get quinacridone gold, transparent pyro orange, quinacridone magenta, dioxys and purple, cobalt teal, which is arguably the most expensive pigment in the set, and then the green gold, which is also sometimes known in brands as azo gold or azo green. Now, there's not a lot of information about what Aquazol is. They're not too clear about it, but they do say that it's fully intermixable with every other watercolor. They all came out a little bit different of a texture pretty consistent, but the dioxys in purple was quite runny. Again, I saved the cobalt teal for us to do together so we could just see one on camera. But two of them separated a bit from their binder. The um, green gold, which is also known as azo green in most other brands, and the quinacridone magenta. Aquazole happens to look a whole lot like uh, gum arabic to me. So I'm just putting it out there. It looks 
it looks like gum arabic to me and i'm kind of wondering if the gimmick here might just happen to be if aquazole is their own registered trademarked brand name of gum arabic i can't confirm that um I, i'm just speculating on what could be happening but i suspect possibly that might be the case i don't know so we are going to do some swatches first off we'll do that together my very first time swatching these i have only just put these out fresh i've never touched them myself so it's gonna be a first experience first impression for us for these colors for this palette today we're gonna to do a flow test as you can see i got some of that purple in my fingers because it really was runny quite a bit of that came out we're gonna do a flow test we're gonna see how they mix with other paints and then lastly i'll come back in a week and i'll see how they reactivate with water because i've heard I can't confirm or deny yet, but I have heard that they don't re-wet very well. All right, so I decided to go ahead and zoom you down in here for the swatching and for the flow test and the paint mixing and all that stuff. But there's one more thing I wanted to mention before we go any farther, because this is odd to me. I love Golden. I love the brand Golden. I have a ton of their stuff just hanging around on my art desk here as I love their acrylics, okay? So I've got a ton of their stuff. I support them. They're my favorite, one of my favorite art companies and I love them. But there's something strange happening here with their paint tubes for this uh, watercolor. So for here for Quinacridone Gold, we have an ASTM Light Fest rating of two. So we're using numbers. Then for this one, we're using words. We have Doxas in purple, Light Fest rating is excellent. All right. Uh, transparent power orange light fast rating is good well, what the heck does good mean you know if you're a professional artist you take this stuff very seriously why are we going from numbers to words and what what exactly does good mean you know or how does that relate to the ASTM or the blue wool scale I'd like to know that so that's interesting I feel like typically when I have a product um, from Golden, yeah, like they're acrylic, it's, we're using numbers, ASTM D Light Fast 1. We're not, we're clearly not using the same scale here with their watercolor, so I'm disappointed in that. Uh, I think that we could do better. Also, Green Gold has that good rating. Well, what does good mean? Um, is it equivalent to a 2 with the ASTM D? Or, what, I mean, what, what does good mean? I, I, well, we're good. I don't know what that means. So I wanted to put that out there. I'm sorry I had to I had to say something. So let's go ahead and start swatching these out. We'll start with the Quinacridone Gold. So that's this one. Oh, that's pretty. Um, all right. Now I'm gonna put it over some ink there. And I'll just kind of let some float down. Now, this is a Series 3, as I said, and it's P048 and PY150. Now, am I crazy, or is there a little bit of grittiness there? I don't know. The next color I have is Transparent Pyro Orange. This one came out the most stiff. The most stiff and the most solid. Hmm. It is re-wetting, but I, I want you guys to know that, especially for paint I just put out, a little suspicious because it's definitely not re-wetting as well as Daniel Smith, for example. Um, very bright color already, though, right off the bat. Let me just go ahead, some of that down there. Certainly it's not going to re-wet as well as an M. Graham. But, you know, we don't have honey in there. Very bright, vibrant, lovely, lovely color there. I'm going to go ahead and just wet some of the bottom of the Quinacridone Magenta. Oh, Transparent Pyro Orange is a Series 2. It has a light fast rating of good, whatever that means. And we have P071 as the pigment. It is very, very bright. Come in there. That looks like gum Arabic separation to me. I don't know. Now this is PR122, their Quinacridone Magenta. Oh, flows out really nice. It's beautiful. It's very nice. We're going to have to mix that with some Ultramarine Blue 
Um, we don't have any from this brand, but I remember their ultramarine blue, and I, I remember it granulated a lot. Um, but I'd like to see what kind of purple we can get with that. Here is the Doxas in purple, which was the most runny, but I think that's pretty common across brands with Doxas in purple. Oh, they're calling theirs, yeah, Doxas in purple. This is also known as Carbazol, Violet, and Doxas in Violet. Wow, that is almost black in mass tone. There's no shortage of pigment for any of these, I have to say. Oh boy, wow. All right, so what I'd like to do is, because that's just so dark and it covered the ink right up, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to put a smaller, more diluted swatch down there as well. This is highly pigmented, which Doxas in Purple should be, but I want to put a, a slightly more dull, not dull, a slightly more dilute swatch there for you guys to see that. It's very, very pretty. We're going to have some new pigments for, for our watercolor comparison series, and I don't think we've done magenta. Or, or violet yet, so that'll be good to compare it to the other brands I have. I know I have Winsor & Newton, Daniel Smith, M. Graham. I'm going to skip over Cobalt Teal for now, and I don't know how well you're going to be able to see that, um, but there's definitely some separation there, and it looks, looks very much like gum Arabic to me. I feel like I'm working a bit harder at these, you guys, to get them to dissolve. And that's a little bit nerve-wracking because I literally just put them out. So I'm worried about how that's going to translate later a week from now. Will I be able to? Are they going to be hard as rocks? I don't know. Here's green gold. This is a Series 3, and it is PY129. Let's see. Green Gold or Azo Green is not my favorite pigment. Um, it's just not. And it's not the most transparent either. And did you notice there's just a slight grittiness, I feel like, to these paints. Um, I don't know if you're noticing, but I'm noticing that. So here's the Green Gold. Light Fast is good, whatever that means. Okay, I just wanted to insert a little disclaimer here. I realized I was being extra salty about the light fast thing, not being consistent uh, across what standards they're holding these ratings to. Um, and yes, I realize that most of these pigments are tried and true, trusted pigments. But my point is, is that if you're going to have a line of paints tested for light fastness, as you should, they should all be consistently held to the same standard. So whether you're using the blue wool scale or the ASTM or your own independent light fast testing, which I never really trust those it should be consistent choose one it shouldn't be all over the place across the same line of paint that was my only point okay back to the swatching so there is most of the color swatched out the last one is the cobalt teal which better not get runny and go all over my hands um, I don't like cobalt colors and the biggest reason I don't like cobalt colors is because I feel like they're kind of opaque and chalky and they're not my favorite but it came in this set so we'll go ahead and we'll put this out to other. All right, a lot runs out, like a whole lot runs out all at once there. This is a Series 4, and probably I know it's the most expensive in the set, and it's a light fast of excellent. Look how milky that already is. I know some of you are going to love this color. I've already got a little grudge against it, and I apologize. That's why I saved it for last, because it's not my favorite. It's like gouache, um, kind of. So, yeah. You can see it's milky. There's no white added to this, but it looks like there is. So, can you see that? It almost looks like there's been white added, but there's been no white added. It's just the nature of it, and it does granulate. And listen, if you love this color, I'm not hating on you. You're absolutely allowed to love that color and it be your favorite color. It's personal preference. I just don't like cobalt colors, um, and I kind of don't like cadmium colors for that same reason, but at least they're very bright. Um, 
and I understand why it was included in this set. All right, so now that the paints are swatched out and dry, or mostly dry, I think, I think they're pretty dry. Um, I have to say, I like the cobalt teal a little bit better now that I see it with the other colors and when it's most of the way dry, but it is still semi-opaque. One of the things that I kind of don't like about their tube information is that it is a little bit lacking. Normally, when you pick up a tube of watercolor, it would have a transparent rating so whether it's transparent semi-transparent opaque whatever they didn't do that with these either so the the tubes are beautiful to look at but they don't give me all of the information that I would like like a Daniel Smith tube would so I'd like to try mixing them with uh, some traditional watercolors I have some M grams and some Daniel Smith here I think we'll go ahead and we'll use uh, M. Graham's Ultramarine Blue today. So here's the Quinacridone Magenta by Core mixed in with a little bit of M. Graham's Ultramarine Blue. And then I'm going to mix in some more, start bringing it to a more neutral violet. That's beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? And then I'm going to mix it mix it out with quite a bit of the ultramarine blue so we have a nice blue violet color and these are the violets that I like I tend to prefer it that way um, mixed versus a tube violet like dioxazin because I feel like when I compare it right next to it dioxazin violet it is gorgeous and it's very intense and it's convenient but I also kind of think it has a tendency to be a little bit more dull intense all right, I also have some phthalo green here. And phthalo green with quinacridone gold is one of my favorite like sap green mixtures. So you can see the colors do beat up on this metal palette. That is completely normal. Um, completely, completely normal. The more you use it, the less it should do that. Which one is quinacridone gold? This one, it almost looks brown, dry. So let's see that mixed with some of that phthalo green. So here is more toward the phthalo green. Isn't that pretty? And then here is more toward the quinacridone gold, which gets us very close to that green gold color. Nice. Let's do a quick flow test. So we'll wet this area out and we'll drop in a few colors to do a flow test. I'll start with the gold. This is already starting to give me a little bit of an issue with re-wetting, so I don't like that. So here we go. Drop it in. It flows very much like you would expect. I didn't predict any issues with flow. The first time I tried these in that sample that I got, um, I didn't have any issue then either. Ooh! Look at that! That's interesting. So the flow is nice. They're doing some interesting things in there. So they are fully mixable with other watercolors. That's definitely true. I, I wouldn't think there'd be any reason for them to lie about that. Let's do, um, let's wet out another little area here and we'll, we'll test the flow on some of the others as well. What, which one should we do? Uh, we'll do a little bit of that violet, which is so intense. I mean, so crazy, crazy intense. So that might be the most pigmented dioxazin I've ever had. And then we'll add a little bit of the green gold. Let's let's do that. Why not? Yep. Yeah. So they flow really, really nice. Now, the High Chroma set is really like a, a little specialty set. I don't think that they're implying that you could do a whole painting with these, you know. These, these are add-ons. You'd have to have your standards and your basics already. Um, and then you add these in. But this would make a great gift, these colors in a set, I think. So that was fun. I really like the configuration of colors here. 
They perform very nicely. These ones aren't too gritty, and I, I feel like some of their earth tones really are kind of gritty from past experiences that I've had Alrighty with them. Alrighty then, so it has been a week. I've played around with them significantly more. I did a little uh, tonal study of an orb. I have some comparisons, and I want to talk about how they re-wet. I feel like I've worked with them in a few different applications now, and I feel like I really am uh, capable of giving a very accurate assessment, so I'm ready to give my full review. So uh, remember I told you we'd come back and we'd talk about comparing Winsor & Newton's um, Quinacridone Magenta to the core. I do feel like the core is just a step above Winsor & Newton. I'm, I'm surprised by that because I've purchased the Winsor & Newton Quinacridone Magenta for years because I think it's always been a step above the rest. You know, it's more vibrant and chromatic than Daniel Smith, certainly. Uh, M. Graham doesn't make a color like that. Um, so it's always been my favorite. I've always bought the giant tube of it, but the core is very good. It is slightly more chromatic. You can see it's just glowing on camera, so that is incredible. I did a couple glaze tests. They glazed really well. Nothing lifted back up, which is a, a sign of a good paint when it when it glazes well and things don't lift up too easily. Sometimes if you're working with a, a paint that has a honey binder like the Sennelier, um, they might not glaze as well because they re-wet too easily and they start lifting up and colors muddy. So that's not a problem with these at all. That They glazed very very, very well. Um, I messed around. I kind of mixed up a sepia tone here. I was able to mix it using the doxes in purple, the quin gold, and the green gold. I was really happy with that tone. I wished I'd kind of done the whole study in that sepia tone just for the sake of traditionalism, but I chose the violet because it is near black in mass tone. This is, uh, doxes and violet tends to be near black in mass tone anyway, um, and is very saturated color, but especially in their brand, I think it's the most saturated uh, violet I've ever owned. So it worked really well. I took my time with this orb and I built up the colors very slowly. I started off with very light washes. One thing that I noticed about this paint um, was that not only, I used several different techniques on this orb, so it's not my best work, but I just wanted to test the paint out. It glazed like very well, like I had originally said, but the other thing it works really well for is that I like to come in with, uh, lay down a passage of color, and then I'll rinse my brush off, blot it to get it damp, and I'll come in and I'll just sort of roll over the edge to blend and soften the line, and this worked great for that. Not every paint does that, especially with, um, really staining colors like these, but it worked great for that technique, the core, so I want to tell you that. And then um, in the shadow here, I used a little bit of that sepia tone just to play around with it and experiment with it a bit, so that's why it's not perfectly matching the orb, um, but I just wanted to kind of use it. Uh, the paints have a distinct kind of cauliflower bloom. That pattern I've replicated it over and over again, no matter what the situation is. It's beautiful, but sometimes you may not always want that. So something to kind of keep in mind there. You might want to um, watch it and soften it out as it dries maybe to prevent that. But I mean, even in swatches, it consistently happened. So more so than other paints, those blooming and the flowing. Um, I definitely think it flowed better than any other paint I've probably tried almost. Um, so I will give them credit in the flow category. And I will say also that... Um, I, th I don't know if they're using ox gall. I know they sell like a synthetic form of ox gall to go along with their paints as a medium, but beautiful paints, really, truly beautiful. I was very happy and I thought the, per the paints performed very well. And I loved that I was able to build up that saturation of color very easily. It's a complaint I had with Winsor & Newton in the past is I felt like their paints just didn't have as much pigment as other brands. I wasn't able to get those rich saturated darks, but here you can see I intentionally got, went very dark. So you could see just how, what, how wide of a range of tonal values I was able to achieve. So very happy with it. I've got some comparisons down here. Down this column here is all the core paints, and then I've got um, mostly Winsor Newton and a Daniel Smith and an M. Graham, so I'll go along, I'll point out the differences. So this is the Doxes and Violet. Core was the most saturated, I think. Um, very comparable to the Winsor Newton. Winsor Newton is very lovely, though, I have to say. The Quinacridone Gold is that one? Yeah, Quinacridone Gold. Very comparable to Winsor & Newton's Quinacridone Gold. Um, maybe a little more orange. My favorite Quinacridone Gold is by M. Graham, though. I feel like it has the most glowing kind of goldish yellow undertone in the tints. So that's personal preference, though. But it is a very good paint. Um, 
we spoke already about the quinacridone magenta. I would definitely purchase their quinacridone magenta again. Very comparable to Winsor & Newton, but uh, maybe just a little bit more vibrant. Down here, I've got the uh, transparent pyrrole orange. I'm comparing it to Daniel Smith's. Personally, I do prefer Daniel Smith's. Um, it's just a personal preference of hue, but it is very vibrant, very, very glowing, vibrant, chromatic, and lovely. I really do like right, it. So to wrap up in conclusion, I did want to mention that when I came back a week later, the paints did re-wet very well. I thought it was going to be an issue. It seemed to be a little bit of an issue at the start, and I'm not sure why, but uh, I came back a week later, and they have that little shine to them. I don't know if there's a little bit of glycerin in there. Definitely no honey, but there's probably a little glycerin or something in there, and they actually re-wet really, really well, but they held firmly to the palette. They're not going to fall out. So I can use the tin as it's intended for a palette and mixing area. So that is a huge bonus and that's great. I live in a dry climate. So if they were going to crack and fall out, I think they would have. If you live in a very humid environment, um, I think you'll still be very happy with these paints. I don't, I don't think you'll have any issues putting them in a metal box. Overall, I really, really like them. And I actually do recommend them. I think they're very, very good. And they're cost effective right now. Right now, the price on these is amazing. You can get sets like these relatively affordably. I think the value here was definitely there. It was really good. I'm happy with my purchase. And um, I think the quality of these comparably, you know, very close to Daniel Smith. I think they're just, they're every bit as good. So that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you found this helpful, please don't forget to give me a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos. If you're interested in my review on the Winsor & Newton paints or the Daniel Smith paints, I'll leave them in the description box down below because I already did a full review. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave them in the comments. And as always, have a great day, guys, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!